All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, we are the Democrats Abroad Ohio team with members living from all across Ohio, living around the world. My name is Angela Bobbs, and I'm a Cincinnati native. Uh, other team members are Karen Lee, who is from Galleon, Mansfield, and Columbus, uh, Nikki, who's from Zinnia, and Kenton is originally from Toledo. Jeff was born in Cleveland and grew up in Columbus, and Christine is from Chagrin Falls and South Euclid. Uh, a couple of people who aren't here, uh, Miguel is from Columbus, uh, along with Rebecca. So welcome, everybody. Um, after our guest speaks, we'll have a Q&A and we'll, um, you can ask questions by putting star star hand up in the chat. I would like to turn it over to Jeff right now, who will introduce our speaker. Okay, thanks, Angela. And also another reminder uh, is to uh, keep an eye on the chat room because we'll be adding some links there as we're going along, uh, which can give you some more background information about what we're talking about. All right, and with that, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Molly Shack, who is a Columbus native and co-executive director of the Ohio Organizing Collaborative, uh, or OOC. OOC is a grassroots organization that unites community organizing groups, student associations, and faith organizations throughout Ohio. And at the state and local levels, their priorities are centered around economic justice, criminal justice reform, and structural democracy reform, uh, in particular, expanding voting rights. Uh, two of their mottos are democracy is a 365 day endeavor and building a multiracial people powered Ohio. So we have invited Molly today to learn more about OOC's organization and activities and to have a conversation about our common goals and interests because we too are very interested in keeping voters uh, engaged and motivated 365 days a year. And currently we all have a very high priority, which is to get voters to register and turn out for a no vote on the August 8th special election. Um, and as it happens, Molly is currently in Budapest, Hungary for what she's told us is an international grassroots training event, which has made us rather curious. Um, that's very international, so it's right up our alley. And um, so we hope to learn a little, little bit about that as well. All right, Maya, Molly, it's all yours. Awesome. Well, uh, Jeff, thanks so much for inviting me to be here. And um, I am in a hotel room in Budapest, as Jeff said. So if my internet cuts out at any point, or if you guys can't hear me, please just come off mute, interrupt, let me know, and I'll do what I can to adjust. Uh, but so far, it's been so good. Um, it is an honor to be with you all. Um, and I've heard a little bit about what you all do over the years from Jeff. Um, and I'm just really excited about sharing what we've been up to in Ohio, uh, sharing a little bit about what I've been learning here in Budapest and talking about what's going on uh, back home. So I was born and raised in Ohio and uh, in Columbus and got involved in organizing at Ohio State's campus. And I'm going to share my screen briefly just to give a little bit of an overview of the OOC, um, how we think about our work. And then I'm going to share a little bit about the August special election, ways that folks can get involved. I'm going to talk a little bit about Hungary, and then I'll open for questions and we can have our conversation based on that. So my internet seems to be doing well, so I'm just going to go ahead and start the show. Can you guys see my screen okay? Yes, we can see it. Awesome. So this is us at the OOC. Um, we are a 501c3 nonpartisan organization. We believe in democracy. We believe in people getting out to vote. And unfortunately, there's uh, one party in Ohio right now who doesn't believe in that. And so we are in a broad-based coalition fighting for voter rights. Um, we have a sister 501c4 organization that does do more partisan and political work called the Ohio Organizing Campaign. Um, our mission, as Jeff said, is to organize. Um, we do organizing in all of its forms, community, student, faith-based organizing, community organizing, um, and we work in coalitions with labor unions, policy partners, think tanks, research organizations to try to advance social justice in our communities. 
Um, if any of you recall 2011 when the SB5 issue two campaign happened, I think that was probably um, one of the big peak moments um, in Ohio's grassroots history, uh, in recent history anyway, um, when the um, Republican Party tried to take away collective bargaining rights. I know OOC really came to be a scaled organization in that season, organizing and fighting. We led the allied outreach to defeat that initiative. So student organizing, faith and community outreach um, was led by the OOC. We've also organized um, to advance childcare issues. Um, one of the things I've been learning in many countries in Europe, things that we do not have access to in the United States is universal childcare in many communities, let alone affordable, accessible childcare. Um, so we've been working on passing and expanding preschool initiatives, childcare initiatives across the state um, since 2016. We've done a lot of work around criminal justice reform, working to move away from punitive-based approaches to our criminal legal system and move towards more public health-based and community-based approaches. Um, our student and youth movement has been at the front and center of the Black Lives Matter movement, fighting for police accountability all across the state. Many of you all probably recall Tamir Rice um, that was killed in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, made international news. We fought to um, institute a civilian review board in 2021 um, that is one of the most powerful and strong civilian review boards in the country. Um, we run the largest nonpartisan voter registration and voter education uh, initiative in the state. And all of our work focuses primarily on two constituencies, young voters and black voters in our state who are less represented than older white voters in terms of registration and participation. And unfortunately, voter contact programs tend to be negatively reinforcing. So if you do not vote, often people do not contact you about voting. If you are someone who votes regularly, you might get sent mailers and get phone calls and be like, why are you talking to me? I'm gonna vote. Don't you know, waste your time on somebody else. But a lot of times campaigns are focused on getting to just 50 plus one. So they focus on who are the people who are most likely to vote for me and let me make sure they're gonna vote for me. Um, we flip the formula. We say, who are the people who are the least likely to vote? Who needs to hear from us the most? And we focus on issues that resonate with people to try to connect them to why voting matters. And so often people, you know, they hear about a presidential race, maybe they hear about a Senate or a congressional race, um, but, you know, it's our sort of theory that the things that drive um, organizing and bringing people off the sidelines often are grassroots campaigns and issue campaigns that really affect people's everyday lives. So you can have a conversation about those things and, it can overlap with candidates, but what that might look like is saying, hey, you know, if you're mad about police accountability or the lack of in our community, do you understand that these prosecutors who are running are elected and they are the ones who are actually deciding if and how to charge these officers? Or did you know that judges, if you care about drug policy or criminal justice reform, the people who are making sentencing decisions about whether to charge a 16 year old as a young person in a juvenile detention center or to charge them as an adult and send them away and bond them over, those judges are elected. So helping to connect concrete issues in communities to our government, to our civic infrastructure, and help people have real strategies that can impact uh, the things that they care about, that's how we do politics. And so um, over the last decade, we've registered um, close to 500,000 voters. We will after this next cycle, hopefully cross that finish line. Um, and unfortunately in Ohio, as in some other states across the country, um, every time we register voters, they get purged and we're sort of on a, a negative, um, you know, what do they call it? Like a rat race, like a, a mouse wheel of, you know, we register 50,000 voters, the state will purge 100,000. We register 100,000 voters, they purge 200,000. So ever since, um, you know, Obama was elected twice in Ohio, we've seen some of the most sweeping voter suppression uh, effects of policies like purges. We have the, one of the most strict voter registration deadlines in the country. They just recently in this past legislative session changed our voting laws. All of these things have a cumulative effect on top of extreme gerrymandering that our districts, our, our communities have on average about a, a five to 10% lower participation rate than other similarly situated states in the Midwest. So we think that you know, getting more people out to vote is a big part of how we build a healthier and stronger democracy around the issues that people care about. So um, what that looks like for us is grassroots organizing. You know, we think that people running relational programs on their campuses, in their churches, at their synagogues, in their neighborhoods, in their community centers, 
with trusted messengers is the best place to start to build campaigns around the things that we care about. That's sort of base building organizing. We also do that large scale civic engagement to educate voters and bring people off the sidelines. And then we focus on narrative and communications, which I've got lots of thoughts uh, coming out of this trip to Hungary, understanding how um, you know, media and narrative is being used all across the world to try to pit people against each other. We think that having narratives that really focus on bringing people together across race and being explicit about race, being race forward in our conversations to say whether you're black or white, you know, we all you know want to come together and fight for the things that our communities need, that we need to be more explicit about, you know, rejecting division, rejecting racism, um, when some of the things that we thought were settled debates in this country are very much uh, being debated again. Some of our reach. Um, so our primary biggest program anchors are in Columbus, Cleveland, and Cincinnati. Um, we also have offices in Dayton and Youngstown. And then you'll see that we have reach into a number of other counties, especially where we have college campuses. Um, so uh, Portage County, for example, um, is where Kent State University is. Greene County is where Central and Wilberforce are, which are HBCUs. Um, you know, we've got a growing number of folks all across the state who are getting involved and taking action to register, educate, and mobilize voters around issues that they care about. So that's just a, a little sense of where we are. And what is happening right now in Ohio is a big movement to fight and protect democracy. I, I really don't think we've seen this kind of broad-based coalition uh, since the SB5 issue to fight in Ohio when uh, the state tried to take away collective bargaining rights. And what you see are some photos from the rallies on May 3rd and May 10th um, when we were still fighting in the state house to defeat HJR1 and SJR2, um, the joint resolutions that put this August special election forward. And um, literally thousands of people marched, took action, gave testimony, shut down the state house basically. And um, while we were successful in pushing back um, this vote and our advocacy efforts, I think we're much more successful than people thought. Um, as many of you all know, unfortunately, we um, have to fight this fight uh, at the ballot box now. And they pushed through the vote with a, a pretty slim majority. And you know what we saw was because um, the abortion constitutional amendment is heading for the November ballot, and they missed the window to put this on the May ballot because they didn't have the votes back then, they created an August special election um, that would allow them to try to change the rules around ballot initiatives uh, before we have a chance to elect and protect uh, abortion in our constitution. And I'll say, in my opinion, I think there are pretty big convergences happening right now in why um, the right wing is fighting so hard to take away majority rule in Ohio. And I think that the combination of people joining together to fight to raise wages, joining together to fight to end gerrymandering through independent redistricting commissions, and joining together to fight uh, to protect abortion, these are all extremely popular measures that they know if Ohio voters have the chance to weigh in on will sail past 50%. Um, and they don't want that. And so what this initiative that they're putting on the August ballot does is um, raises the threshold from a simple majority of 50% to 60%. And it changes the signature threshold for right now, you have to have 5% of the last gubernatorial election and 44 out of the 88 counties, it would increase it to 88 counties out of 88 counties. I've done canvassing all over the state. I've talked to people all over in every corner. Um, it would be very, very difficult to get 5% in some of the smaller rural deep uh, counties. And so it's and would make it sort of cost prohibitive and organizing wise prohibitive to really be able to put initiatives on the ballot. So the August special has some challenges that we you know, want to be sober about as we're thinking about um, getting people engaged in this election. They did not pick an August special for no reason. They did not eliminate August special elections in the last session for no reason. There were many quotes by the people who are supporting this now that said it was expensive and low turnout and um, you know, a big burden on boards of elections. Well, they know all those things um, and they, they went forward with it anyway. So. You know, we have to keep that in mind as we're thinking about this upcoming August special election um, that the um, and actually they they set aside 15 million. So they've even underfunded um, the boards of elections who have to administer this election by five million dollars based on what it costed last time. So you've got boards of elections who are frustrated and burned out from having to do these elections. 
um, they're already experiencing challenges recruiting poll workers and making sure their infrastructure is strong and ready for fall, and they're going to have to do two back-to-back -back elections. Um, so, you know, there is a, a lot of sort of challenges that we need to be able to pay attention to and weigh in on. Um, so there are folks working to recruit poll workers and make sure that election has all of the infrastructure that it needs right now. Um, but we are working very, very heavily on the No in August campaign. Um, so we are um, we sort of pivoted to start to say vote no in August, vote no on issue one at the same time and repeat those two messages over and over again, um, partially because in the fall, most people will be saying vote yes on issue one. So we want to sort of remind people that there is an election in August. A lot of people just don't know that. Um, so, and I'm sure Jeff can help get these materials out, um, but there is a toolkit that has been uh, launched uh, in the past couple of weeks that has all sorts of social media, uh, scripts, um, graphics, press statements, things that you can use in any organizational or personal infrastructure that you all have uh, to get the word out um, with poll tested messages and with um, sort of simple messages that help direct people to get more information. If you go to the campaign's website itself, you'll see all the endorsements that have started to come in. There is a massive, I think in the legislative campaign, we had close to 200 organizations that had endorsed um, the, the no campaign. And um, they're collecting those endorsements again for the August special election. But what we've seen is there is a massive coalition of community labor, civic organizations, um, nonprofit organizations, and even every single former governor of Ohio has come out against it. Former secretaries of state have come out against it, uh, Democrat and Republican. Uh, so what we're seeing is a party that wants to maintain power and control uh, that is pushing this with a small minority of people who have a disproportionate and unearned amount of power that they are trying to keep and protect. And we think they're going to have a lot of money because um, there are people nationally who do not want to see redistricting reform. There are people in state with big and deep pockets that don't want to see wages get raised. Um, and there is a deep bench of people who are willing to put money up to prevent uh, women from being able to have autonomy over their bodies. So we have a lot of work to do to get the word out, but everybody who does hear the word for the most part is with us. Um, and we feel really confident that we're going to be able to win this campaign um, in August. So there are flyers coming out, um, but this um, has some of the key dates that are coming up. So the registration deadline in Ohio is July 10th. Um, early voting starts on the 11th and the 8th is our election day. Um, there is new voter ID laws in the state that we have to be aware of. Um, ironically, if you are voting by mail, you do not need an ID and you can just use the last four digits of your social like you've always been able to. But when folks are going to vote in person and they're doing what is functionally in-person absentee voting, now they do have to show an ID. It cannot be expired and it has to either be a driver's license, a state ID, a passport, or a military ID. Um, they did create a new opportunity for people to get a free state ID, uh, but you do have to go to the BMV um, and you know, go to a state official bureau office and get one. So um, there is an organization called Vote Riders. If you're doing any contact with folks that is coordinating rides to go get IDs, um, so that voteriders.org and 1866 ID to vote, um, those uh, that website and that phone number will connect you with somebody who can help take anybody in the state to go get an ID so that they can go vote. Um, we think this was a pretty targeted attack against young people. Uh, who tend to not have IDs at the same rates and people of color who do not have IDs at the same rates. So we wanna make sure that we're overcoming that and getting that word out. Um, there are pledge cards and uh, voter contact materials available and I can uh, get Jeff connected with the uh, campaign. Um, if anybody wants to order postcards or wants to do any of that sort of uh, voter registration reminders, you can order a box. I think the only thing you have to pay for is um, the stamps. Um, if you're going to be sending those out, they provide the materials. Um, so there are lots of ways that from wherever you are, it might, I don't know if that's the best tactic for you all if you're uh, abroad, but um, there are lots of tactics uh, that you guys could use to get the word out about the August special. Um, and we have opportunities uh, for folks to be in the press as well. We're trying to get lots of letters to the editors and op-eds um, and help people uh, get the word out from lots of different voices, lots of different perspectives about why this uh, ballot initiative uh, is dangerous and why we need to protect the one person, one vote 
provision in our constitution and protect our ability uh, to advance ballot initiatives. Um, this was the voter ID stuff that I pretty much already said. Um, so I will keep moving through that. And then finally, I will share a little bit about what I'm doing in Hungary right now and why I'm here. Um, but I suppose maybe before I go into this and why I'm here, does anybody have questions about what I shared on the August 8th campaign? If you have a question, um, please just go ahead and say it since you'll be the first person. Otherwise, you start our hand up in the chat. Um, or maybe everybody would like to ask questions later. Okay, great. I'll keep moving. Feel free to interrupt me if you guys have questions, and then we can have a conversation at the end. Um, so I am on a trip right now in Budapest with um, an organization that OOC is affiliated with called Faith in Action. They are the country's largest network of faith-based community organizing groups in the country. Uh, they do multi-faith, multi-racial community organizing, voter engagement work, um, and they've been helping to facilitate international exchanges. They have a network of grassroots organizing that they're supporting um, here in Hungary, in Rwanda, in El Salvador, um, in a number of countries across the world. And um, I think mostly in the global south, but a little bit in Europe. Um, and part of the goal of these exchanges are to help grassroots organizers learn from each other, um, learn from what are the things that are just the same about bringing people together around issues that they care about no matter where you are, um, and what are the things that are different. And so I think um, this, this trip to Hungary, understanding the Viktor Orban regime um, and the pretty explicit slide towards authoritarianism that has been happening here over a series of cycles and the really, really intentional connection between the American right and the um, Fidesz, the right-wing party, um, that Viktor Orban's party that governs um, the majority here in, in the Hungarian parliament, I think is really concerning. And it's very clear that they are learning from each other. So if you guys have been following the sort of big right-wing conferences have been taking place here, they've brought Viktor Orban out to um, America to speak at conservative conferences back home. And the trends that um, I think we've seen are a focus on anti-democratic practices, changing election rules, and sort of structurally undermining elections. There have been you know, things that are very similar around reducing and restricting ballot initiatives and citizen referendums here. They've changed voting laws, they've changed voting districts, they've changed where people can vote from and the rules around um, expats voting versus people who are living right outside the country. And so um, we've seen very, very similar patterns. There's also been a strong focus on the courts and the judicial system, similar to back home, and there's been a focus on the media. So there is a, I think, strong desire in both of our countries to maintain the illusion of democracy while uh, fighting to undermine it through the courts, through the media, and through election laws. One of the things that I think you can't read in the New York Times that I got a chance to learn from here um, while I was in this place, um, we visited with an organization called the School of Public Life um, that trains and develops grassroots and civic leaders all across uh, Hungary, but they're anchored here in Budapest. Um, and really focusing on developing the civic and democratic capacity of community organizations to help people who might do direct service or think about themselves as a civil service organization to develop a, a consciousness around democracy, around getting people involved in public life, which could mean elections and voter engagement, but often means helping people build their own power in communities. And so we were talking about what it means to do base building organizing and how to help people who might not think that um, democracy is directly relevant or um, you know, is, a, is even worthwhile? How do you help to build connections with people around the issues that matter most to them and help them see an avenue for a political future where things could actually change? Um, and obviously in you know, this country transitioning out of state socialism into a, a very strong sort of neoliberal democracy um, infrastructure has been a big shift for uh, the people here in, in Hungary. And so um, I think there are 
similarities in our systems. There's also, you know, very strong differences, but watching um, over the last few days, how people here um, have been committed to developing the sort of next generation of civic leaders and the pictures here you see are from the School of Public Life Training Center and from a conference that they hosted at the Central European University um, here in Budapest, which unfortunately uh, is starting to shut down and move to Vienna as the headquarters, I think is just like another sign that we need to invest in the people who are fighting back and the people who are building civic capacity, um, because there is so much opportunity and there are so many people. We um, spent some time learning about the 8th District, which is one of the poorest districts in Budapest that has opposition leadership in uh, the mayor's seat. They have a district sort of executive, which I've been learning about. Um, but there are opposition candidates that are winning. Budapest itself has a Green Party mayor that has been driving progressive change. And so, you know, remembering that the story that we've been hearing about Viktor Orban in the New York Times is a real and critical story, but it's not the only story. Um, and I resonate with that, you know, a lot in Ohio. I think a lot of people have a conception about Ohio because of some of the politics that we're seeing. And, you know, the, the attacks on trans kids, the attacks on teaching accurate history about our legacy of slavery and of genocide of indigenous people in America, you know, very similar attacks on education have been taking place here in Hungary. And all of it is an attempt to scapegoat, to distract, to divide people um, while we sort of get prevented from joining together around the issues that people care about. So I think um, lots to learn and lots to lift up from the people who are organizing on the ground and pushing back. So maybe I'll stop sharing my screen and open it up for questions, thoughts, discussion, uh, or reactions. Well, thanks uh, a lot, Molly. This got a lot of wheels turning and we already have the first hand up in the chat room. Uh, that would be Christina. Yeah, hi, I am a voter in Cuyahoga County and my son also votes there, and soon I'll have a grandchild that's going to be voting there. Um, uh, on the, I've also door knocked in, in Cuyahoga County for that initiative uh, for uh, uh, regarding collective bargaining, and it was amazing how many people actually turned out for that. Yeah. My question to you is, and I think it was 2018 when we had on the ballot about gerrymandering, mm -hmm. and that passed with a large majority. It did. And then it was supposed to go into effect, wasn't it 2020? It did. It did. And I would like to know from somebody who has more knowledge about the subject, what happened? I mean, it's a great question. Um, and you're not crazy for asking it. I mean, I think the, the short answer is the laws were overwhelmingly supported. Um, it was bipartisan in its support. And I think over 60% of voters, I mean, it was a huge majority. Uh, voted for those reforms. Um, but when rubber met the road and the commission was convened to start the redistricting process, the majority party, um, the Republicans, functionally ignored every major and critical aspect of the rule and the spirit of the laws that were passed. The chief justice, who was a Republican judge, Maureen O'Connor, um, we were actually litigants in that lawsuit. We sued the state around um, violating the constitution and uh, ignoring the laws. She agreed with us and the other plaintiffs who sued and ruled against their gerrymandering on, I think, seven separate occasions between the congressional and the legislative maps. And essentially, they got into a standoff with uh, the Republican Party. They threatened to impeach her. They basically said, you know, they were going to push to the absolute boundary and say, you know, we don't have to. The penalty for not passing um, maps with bipartisan support is there only a four year map. And they kicked the can over and over and over again until a federal judge had to intervene because we didn't have maps. There had been no agreed upon maps and we were heading towards the 2022 elections. So they gave temporary relief uh, and granted the maps, the gerrymandered ones as they were, two-year maps. And so right now, the maps that we voted on in 2022 were ruled illegal by the chief justice, who is, again, from the Republican Party. And um, now we have to redraw those maps again. Um, the 
court is, I think, less favorable now than it was then. The Chief Justice O'Connor has since retired. She aged out. Um, and so I think status quo is probably the, the most likely best scenario that we'll get. Um, and I think the reality, and this is departing from fact now, and this is my opinion, um, my opinion is that the bipartisan players who cut the deal never intended to follow the spirit of the law when they agreed to that reform initiative, and they did it as a way to prevent real um, enforceable mechanisms from being put into the law by grassroots activists. And so the conversations that people are having now, um, you know, there's been a lot of, you know, talk in the news that the Chief Justice even supports um, independent commissions. And so there have been folks talking about the need to have a real independent commission. And we've learned a lot nationally from states like Michigan and Colorado and other states across the country in the 2020 cycle that implemented independent commissions and got much fairer results. Um, you know, the most recent Supreme Court case, Moore v. Harper, um, was a sort of generally good direction, a surprising one, um, towards protecting the Voting Rights Act and against racial gerrymandering. Um, so I think we, we live to fight another day. Um, my opinion is that we need an independent commission with real enforcement mechanisms in Ohio to produce fair maps. And I think that that is one of the reasons they're fighting so hard right now around this August special, it's because they know that there are undue seats that the Republican Party control, controls in Congress uh, because of their gerrymandering and certainly in the, in the state legislature as well. So I think it's pretty clear that they are afraid of the Ohio voters actually having a fair fight um, and are fighting very hard to prevent that. Our next question is from Kenton. All right. Um, I actually wanted to comment on what you just said. That's not part of my question, but I'll get to my question in a moment. Um, the independent commission, I think that should have been the way that they went in initially, you know, instead of trying to do this political commission, which just we see has not worked at all. Um, if the ballot defeat is defeated on August 8th, um, uh, are, are there, is there then something in the works right now to create a ballot initiative for an independent commission? That's the first thing. And then my second question, the one that I really wanted to ask was, um, on your map, I didn't see anything in Lucas County <laughs> as far as your activities are concerned. Lucas or Wood County or Ottawa County, yeah. you know, Northwest part of the state. Why and are there plans to uh, mobilize up in that area as well? Okay, so the first question is yes, lots of people are talking about independent commissions. Um, there are lots of really smart policy pros that are sort of um, synthesizing what happened nationally, learning from uh, what happened in Ohio, and I think looking at what are some of the best policy options. So there are a number of groups in state who have been doing sort of exploratory conversations about what that would look like and looking at policy options. Um, so I very much think that is on the table. And I think everybody is very clear that if we do it, we got to do it right this time. So I think that's the most important thing that we don't have another wishy-washy, um, you know, ballot campaign, if we're going to do it, it needs to be enforceable, it needs to be strong, and it needs to protect voters. Um, to your second question, we don't have a ton of capacity in Lucas County, unfortunately, um, partially just because we're kind of hubbed in the three C's, hope to grow there, but we do partner closely um, with the Ohio Unity Coalition. It's a woman named Petey Talley, um, who is based in Toledo. She's a longtime uh, labor leader, and she was ahead of the Black uh, Trades Union Association group in state. Um, and she runs a really dynamic community program based out of Toledo. So we work closely with her and we do have some students at um, the University of Toledo and Bowling Green who are active in our student organizing. Um, I know Ohio 9 is an important uh, district and it will be again this next cycle. So um, got lots of love for Toledo. We just don't have the, the biggest team there and we, we work in coalition with the people who are there. Our next question is from Jeff. Um, yeah, Molly, something that you said that really resonated with me was um, when you're talking to someone to make the case for registering and voting, um, make it evident why that's uh, um, why, why that's why that personally affects them. Uh, what's what's uh, what's about what about it is important in their lives, in, in particular, down ballot uh, um, 
elections, like the prosecutors and the judges and the um, state executive offices and things like that, and not just the president all the time, which unfortunately a lot of Americans think is the only thing that we vote for. And um, that reminded me some conversations that we've we've uh, some conversations we've had about um, August eighth and making the case for that because there's uh, there there's a couple of things you can say about that it's it's undemocratic um and it would mean that not only this year but for the foreseeable future it's it would be much more difficult to um uh, uh, to bring initiatives of any kind of any subject and there's also what I really suspect is the immediate cause of that is the is the prospects for an abortion rights amendment in November, which is a real motivator. Which is um, you know I hate the fact that it that it that it, that all of this happened and it got this way, but it's it's um, um, it's gotten a lot of people really enthusiastic to vote. So it's a question of which of you know what part of that do you emphasize, and so how do you see that? How have OOC uh, been approaching that? Yeah, so each of our sort of constituency groups approaches it differently. Um, you know, our students on college campuses are really fired up about abortion. That is the number one issue they're talking about, um, along with the attacks on higher education and um, the ability to teach an honest, accurate, and uh, diverse perspective on our history. Um, there have been some really bad bills coming down the pike. So our student leaders are sort of leading with that. Whereas like the folks that are doing the faith-based organizing, people are not leading in their church organizing around those issues, although there are having those conversations. And I don't think by any means that um, it does not mean that folks don't care, but they're talking about broader voting rights and democracy and, you know, why we can't let, you know, and, and I think people are very annoyed and mad when they find out that they created this August special election out of nowhere so that no one would pay attention. So, you know, a lot of times for me, the conversation is, did you know there's an uh, election this August? No. Well, they don't want you to know, and, and here's why. You know, we've got folks fighting to, um, you know, raise wages, protect abortion, and protect our democracy, and they don't like that. And so they're trying to sneak through an election when no one's paying attention to take away our rights to keep their powers in check with a citizen-led initiative. And so, you know, kind of breaking it down in a way that people understand that there's there's a game that's being played on Ohio voters right now, and they they think that we're not smart enough to to catch on. And so I, I've seen that message be very effective with folks, um, you know, and then I also think the messenger matters. So, you know, one of our membership bases is called Building Freedom Ohio, and they organize all formerly incarcerated people and, um, and their families. And in Ohio, people with felony convictions do have the right to vote. And in many states, um, they don't. And that is uh, leads to a lot of misinformation and disinformation in our communities. They're the best messengers to have those conversations amongst their community to say, hey, we have a, a right and a responsibility and an obligation to join together to use our power and to impact the system in these sets of ways. And um, so having, I think, strategies for communities to be able to reach out to each other, have those person-to-person -person conversations. So every time I'm anywhere, it's like pull out a piece of paper, pull out your phone, think of three or four people who probably won't vote unless you have a conversation with them. So, you know, Christina, if your grandkid is getting ready to be voting age, have her think about three or four people that she thinks might need a reminder, right? Having those kinds of each one reach to a few, I really do think um, is, is the way to break through because people, there's so much input on media that a conversation from your friend, your family member, your neighbor uh, really does make a big difference and cuts through the noise. Right. Our next question is from Christina. Yeah, hi. Um, we see in Ohio voter initiatives uh, can be turned down or ignored. I mean, they have ignored the law. And yes. now we have, uh, it's, it's becoming like a dictatorship. And now we have a governor whose son sits on the Supreme Court and uh, refuses to recuse himself in, in issues that are related to initiatives that his father has presented. I mean, shouldn't we be doing something and taking this to the federal Supreme Court? I mean, it's just awful. I think it's just awful the way they're acting in Ohio. They're acting like dictators. Yeah, and you didn't even mention the $60 billion uh, bribery scheme and the former Speaker of the House that's going to federal prison for, you know, selling votes around the energy bailout. I mean, it, the, the democracy landscape in Ohio is not great. And I do think it's important that we talk about it, but I also think 
um, we have to be careful not to reinforce hopelessness because it is one of the things that um, gives life to authoritarians is people feeling like nothing's going to change and nothing they do is going to matter. And so I think it's important to show what we can accomplish when we come together to defeat uh, and to protect our voice. And it, it is why I do think this August election is a very, very critical first step among many, because if we win this and then we win in November, it's going to send a very clear message that Ohioans are paying attention and they're organizing. So you're not wrong. And I try to focus on like, if we win this in August, we're going to be able to win higher wages. We're going to be able to protect abortion and we're going to show them that we're paying attention and we're organizing. So getting people excited about what we can do, um, I just think is like, it's, it's the organizer's approach to how to build, you know, and, and I think it's, it is the same conversation that we've been having here with folks who elected an opposition candidate to be the mayor of Budapest in a country that's experiencing even more extreme authoritarianism than we are. There's a lot of that sentiment here. And so sort of the job to build a future oriented, hopeful politics. Um, there's a reason hope and change did so well in 20, uh, 2008 and, and 2012. And I think it taps into something that all of us want to be excited about and want to feel like hope is possible. And so um, that would be my only, um, you know, yes. And uh, I always try to try to balance both. Yeah, well, I can assure you that Democrats abroad is very hopeful. And Great. <laughs> Um, okay, the next question is actually for me. Um, you mentioned before that people with uh, felony convictions can vote in Ohio. Do they know that? I mean, is that like a widely publicized fact? I don't think it is widely known. I think there's a lot of misinformation. I think some of it is intentional. I think a lot of it is not. I think it's just like people are confused or a parole officer has told them that they are not allowed to vote or they're not allowed to sign something um, or you know that they can't put their name on anything official until they're off of parole or probation. So there's just a lot of misinformation. So whenever we're out, we carry, um, there's these little like postcards that the ACLU puts out that sort of clears that up. Um, in Ohio, as long as you are not currently convicted for a felony, you have the right to vote, which actually means even if you're incarcerated awaiting trial or if you're in jail on a misdemeanor, you have the right to vote. If you are on probation or parole, you have the right to vote. Literally anything other than currently serving time for a felony conviction. So, um, you know, I think it's really important that we get that word out more and more um, and helping people to have those conversations. I also think Democrats in, you know, progressive counties could be doing more to educate people. You know, every high schooler graduating from a public school in Ohio should be getting a driver's license or a state ID. You know, we should be making sure as people come home from facilities that they understand their rights and their ability to reintegrate into society and have full citizenship and dignity in that way. Uh, so I think we could be pushing local electeds to do more uh, to get that word out and to make sure that people are accessing uh, the rights that they do have. Yeah. Is there any, is, you said that that you have an AC, a card from the ACLU. Is there something on a website or something? Because I know a lot of people in Ohio who've been to jail who don't think they can vote. Yeah, and I know. It's very frustrating. And I, I will send this info to Jeff. Maybe he can get it okay. out to the team. That would um, be great. I, I do think we need to have a broader communication strategy about that to, to get the word out more. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Uh, our next question is from Jeff. Um, you, you, Molly, you mentioned something um, about the the um, the execution of the election in August, and it and I hadn't heard about some of these things, and it, it sounded um, sounded a little bit concerning that uh, there may be some uh, uh, difficulty getting poll workers and getting the facilities to the co conduct the election, and um, it's only a couple of months from now. Um, is there a potential for, for, uh, for a fiasco in, in August? I think so. I hope not, but I think so. I'm really worried about the new ID laws because I've been in polling places before where people were asked to vote provisionally when they did not need to. Um, and I just, I think a lot of people don't know. I'm concerned about training and people understanding the new ID laws, um, common cause, uh, is a good organization that does a lot of work directly with local boards of elections, and they do work with recruiting um, poll workers. So we've been working with them to, um, to do that. But I think that the August part is what makes it hard because, you know, they have this um, 
oh, I forget what they call the program, but they allow high school workers or high school um, age folks to go work at polls to take the day off of school. Um, but like it's August. I don't think people are going to be able to plug into that. I think there's a lot of people on vacation with their families or, you know, just um, not as into the routine of a typical election. So Common Cause would be the best organization to connect with around, um, you know, getting folks in the pipeline for that. But if you do know people who are not necessarily ones to go knock doors or make phone calls, um, asking them to become a poll worker is a another important way that people can get involved. Um, and you don't have to have as much mobility. So I do think, bless their hearts, they always figure it out. We continue to have elections. And I think generally they're administered with care by the people who run them. So I, I think, you know, it, it usually gets done, but I do think it's a concern. Okay. Um, does anyone else have a, a question before we go? It's your last chance. Just unmute and ask your question. All right. No. Okay, great. Um, then I really want to thank Molly for joining us today and everyone for coming. Um, please remember the deadline to register for the August special election is June 10th. And if you haven't already registered, go register today and oh, tell you wow. and tell your friendly friends to also register. Um Angela, people, you said June 10th. That's already passed. I'm sorry, July 10th. Did I say June? Okay, July 10th. Sorry. What I read, what I saw and what I read were two different things. I'm so sorry. Um, uh, it, question. Uh, I already sent my request to become a Ohio, Ohio voter in like a month ago, but I haven't heard anything back. Um, if you haven't heard anything back, then you need to contact your local election office. Um, you should be able to find that on VFA if you don't already have it in the email that, that you got if you went to vote. Did you go to vote from abroad or did you do something else? Um, well, I, I was living, well, I was domiciled at my dad's, but now I'm domiciled at my son's and he's in Cuyahoga County. And okay. I, I went on to the, the Ohio website and, you know, they, there's a, something you can download and fill in and mail back. Okay, well, don't do that. I'm gonna put the link for Vote From Abroad in the chat. And the reason that I say don't go directly if you live overseas, don't go directly to the website is because of the UOCAVA laws that protect us. When they know that you're coming from overseas, you have a certain set of laws and rights that you don't actually have when you're in the, in the United States. So please go request your ballot at votefromabroad.org and then you'll be fully covered. They won't be able to ignore you. And if they and, do- but, but will they find, I mean, but the last election I voted in New Jersey, don't I have to signal to Ohio that I'm there now or not? Uh, when you're do, when your ballot request is also a voter registration. Okay, great. So Perfect. It's, send, it's, send, send me the link. <laughs> yeah, okay. It's, uh, <laughs> let me just put that in the chat quickly and, there you go. You can just go to votefromabroad.org, select your state, which would be Ohio, of course, and then it'll ask you a few questions and it'll get the information sent to the right person in your state. And I am going to be in Ohio in August. Can I go in and vote with my kid? Um, yeah. Yes, you can. Yes, you can, but, but you have to let your local election office know that you're not gonna be voting from abroad, you'll be there. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, all right. So yes, everyone, please. The last, the deadline to register for the August special election is July 10th. Uh, go to votefromabroad.org and request your absentee ballot. Ballots are scheduled to be sent on June 23rd, which is super close, although you can get them right up until the last minute. I mean, you know, they'll they'll be sending them out after June 10th too. Um, once your Ohio ballots can only be returned by postal mail or courier service. And uh, if you'll be voting in Ohio, early voting begins on June 11th and the election day is August 8th. July so, 11th. 
Uh, you stuck on my birthday, Andrew. Oh my God, I don't know why I keep saying June. Oh my God, June is over. It's July, July, July. Just do it now. Don't listen to me. Just go to vote from abroad. Do it now. You got. You don't have a lot of time because the election is in August. Hurry, hurry, hurry. And please do it. And then, of course, we would like to invite you to our event next week. Uh, with David Pepper. He's going to be doing a little book club with us on saving democracy. It should be pretty good. That's his latest book. And thank you, everyone, for coming and joining us today. I think I'm hungry. <laughs> a little blood sugar. You, no, it's, you're thinking Juneteenth. Juneteenth, <laughs> and it comes out June 10th. <laughs> that could be it too uh thanks everybody for joining us today i'm gonna thank you thanks everyone to molly. molly thanks a lot great <clears throat> to be here with you yeah. all good luck thank you so much yeah to you too